Good evening almost. Good afternoon. Um, let's kick this uh, uh, session off. Cutting edge technology, clinical updates on TES, BRS, TAVR and LAA closure. All the abbreviations you can think of. My name is Andreas Baumbach. I'm from London. Uh, I'm here with my co-chair spokesperson Martin Leon. We have discussants to my right. Guillaume Kaila, Petro Lemos, Darren Milot, and we have speakers uh, to various topics, uh, Ben He, Ling Tao, and Lei Song. Uh, we have apologies from Zhu Bo. We would have loved to have him back here in Paris, but he couldn't make it, uh, uh, couldn't travel. So all of this was on wonderful slides, but they have somehow disappeared on the internet. So I'll uh, read just out um, what we have as an objective. Um, Join us if you want to understand the performance of new generation BRS after three years follow-up. That's really exciting. It's the first time I think these data are being presented. To get to know ongoing clinical studies on Firehawk TES, to understand the performance of the VITA flow compared to other self-expanding valves, and to discover the new LAA closure device on the market and its performance after 12 months. So a real potpourri of different technologies. Uh, the session is sponsored by Microport. Um, and uh, with this, we get going. Marty. Thank you very much, my friend Andreas. Um, well, first, it's wonderful to be here. Um, all of you, it's late in the day, so we want to see dynamic energy from you, so we'd like this to be interactive. There are microphones for questions, and please use your smartphone and chat us some questions so we can have a dynamic discussion. We have a wonderful panel. Uh, so with that, let me begin with the first um, um, talk, which is uh, entitled uh, Thinistrut BRS versus Cobalt Chromium EES, Three Year Outcomes of the Future 2 Trial. And this is a very important study, so please listen carefully. The speaker is Lei Song. Thank you, Professor Martin. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Song from Fuwai Hospital. And on behalf of the Future 2 investigator, to report the three year outcomes of the Future 2 study which is a randomized trial comparing signal struct BRAS with its cobalt carbonyl EES as a sun stand. This is disclosure. The future two study was sponsored by funded by Microport. I have no potential conflict of interest to report. As we all know, an expanded higher rate of late adverse event were observed in the first generation BRS may be related to the secret struct sickness, causing greater protrusion and turbulence flow, delayed renalization and unfavorable dismantling during the resorption. Uh, first off is a signal struct PLA-based serolimers eluting BRS, designed to decrease the luminal protrusion and improve local hemodynamic profile. When you read out of the multi-center randomized trial, the most treated that the first stop was not inferior to the uh, ES for the primary endpoint of one-year angiography in segment late loss, and the power, the key secondary endpoint of proportion of cover structs by OCT. Now, data beyond one year is required to assess the longer-term performance of this new device. We here in report the three-year out outcomes of the future two study, and uh, this is just the design of the first uh, BRS. This, which is a blue expandable, highly crystallized PLLA backbone scaffold system, aluminally coated with PDLLA mixed with serolimers using highly accurate and precise point spring techniques. And the future two studies, a prospective multi center randomized trial, all the include, uh, outpatient including the inclusion uh, criteria and not meet any exclusion exterior or randomized with one to one ratio and uh, found uh, about uh, uh, 215 patients in the first of BRS and 215 patients in the uh, ES then. And the primary point was one year uh, non-inferiority endpoint of angiographic in segment late loss, and the key secondary endpoint is proportion of cover structure in OCT. And all the patients will follow up annually up to five years. And finally, we randomized uh, three, uh, 433 patients. And uh, at one year, clinical follow-up rate was 98.6%. Uh, and at three years, clinical follow-up rate was 96.8%, and balance between the two arms. And there's no difference between the two arms about the baseline characteristics. 
And for the procedure characteristic, then uh, uh, we noticed that the post dilatation proportion was higher, uh, significantly higher in the first of the BRS compared with the ES. And immediately post procedure QC shows that the in device diameter stenosis is higher and accurate gain is lower for the for this device BRS compared with EES. Uh, but accurate recoil has similar and the uh, clinical success rate was similar between the two arms. For the primary endpoint of the in-segment late loss, uh, the BRS have nearly lower 0 0.7 compared with 0 0.18, but no difference. P4 into 9 inferiority was less than 0 0.0001. And for the key secondary endpoint, the proportion of cover structs accessed by OCT, both at the struct level and cross-section level, there were no difference. And for non-inferiorities, uh, was less than 0 0.0001. And uh, uh, for, the, for the figure in the bottom, it is noticed that post-procedure, we observed more struct uh, protrusion to the lumen for in the first of BRS. However, both at the post-procedure and at the one year, the proportion of incomplete struct opposition uh, both uh, lower for the BRS with zero, almost, almost zero at one year. Uh, for this curve, we noticed that the three-year event of the target lesion failure uh, gradually increased over three years. There's no difference between the two groups, 4.2% with 3.7%. And for the landmark analysis, there's no difference before or after one year. The P4 interaction was 0 0.41. And for the, each component of the TLF defined as cardiac death, target vessel mild infection, and ischemia driven, target lead and revasculation, there's also no difference at one year, two years, and three years. For the patient oriented or composite endpoints through one year, there's also no difference, 13.8% versus 11.7%. And for the landmark analysis, there's no, so no difference before one year and uh, within one year and uh, three years. The P4 inaction was 0 0.82. For the each component of the POCE, uh, defined as all cause deaths and all myocardial infection and any revasculation, there's also no difference. This, uh, this slide summarizes the three year clinical outcomes. Uh, both the target lead and failure and patient oriented composite endpoint and each component of these two endpoints have no difference. And uh, notably that uh, this is, there is a no device thrombosis event, both in the first up group and the ES group. As a summary, uh, the three-year clinical follow-up result of the future two study demonstrates that sustained and uh, comparable safety and effectiveness of this signal struct PLLA-based BRS compared with the contemporary DES for the treatment of patients with non-complex lesion. Uh, particularly, no DES thrombosis event was observed in either group. Longer term, for example, uh, more than five years clinical follow-up of the randomized trial, as well as a larger scale single arm OPC study, uh, filter two, uh, filter three study, over in 1,000 patients will provide more evidence for this new generation Ferris of BRS in the future. Thank you. Excellent. Petro, you've got the first question. Yes. <laughs> Hello, very nice data, fantastic. So I have a question for you in two parts. Uh, do you think we're gonna see a revival of BRS as number one and number two? Uh, now everybody's talking about DCB more and more. Do you think that this technology will come more towards a stent-like, stent type of, of device or more towards uh, a DCB type of device as, as, an, as an application? Thank you, thank you for your question. And I think for, for the current uh, trial, we can provide solid data that uh, for this, those selected patients, just non-complex lesion, um, in, uh, some focal, de novo lesion without a severe calcium, not so angled and tortuous, we can provide solid data that the new device provide comparable clinical outcomes comparing with the contemporary best sense stand. And but for, but for those uh, complex stand, uh, uh, anatomy, we those still have not enough data to prove that. 
but for the ongoing uh, future street study, which is uh, uh, OPC uh, clinical trial will include over 1,000 patients in the real world, we uh, definitely we can get more data about the uh, what's uh, reality in the in the in the real world. But uh, uh, for now, I can say this this new device uh, only could per provide a great result for those high, highly selected patient. But uh, uh, maybe uh, in the future, the development of the material technique will provide enough support with uh, similar sickness with the DES, give more, uh, more hopeful uh, to retrieve, uh, to retrieve this uh, new uh, BRS. Thank you. And uh, for the second question, I think this is a very good question. For, the, for this uh, highly selected simple lesion, de novo, uh, focal, non-calcified, maybe it's also a good uh, candidate for the DCB. And uh, particularly for those, uh, the idea of the in, uh, intervention, but not without permanent implantation. And uh, I think that's the, for this, for this, for this lesion, I think uh, uh, also uh, if the if we prepare the lesion very carefully without big dissection, I think the both the BRS and the D, and the DCB is a good option. And for the if we uh, pre dilatation use the uh, cause have already have causing big dissection, where is usually happen for the uh, DRBRS because we use a bigger per dilatation balloon and in this situation and BRS may be uh, more suitable. And uh, just uh, like the, my colleague Professor Tao just uh, talked this afternoon, I think it's also an interesting pathway that we use the BRS as a uh, bailout op option for the D DCB if we believe that uh, idea of the intervention without permanent implantation. Thank you. Leave nothing behind. I think the, the idea is coming round, and there's several uh, products, of course, that have made it, uh, even today uh, on stage, uh, we have presentation of long-term results and, and early results. I have a question. Um, remind us of the absorption time. When do you think this particular bioresorbable scaffold is completely absorbed? Yes, for the, uh, for the for this future two study, we have now the uh, uh, OCT uh, endpoint for the three years. So we only have data from the future one, which is a film study of the three years. We have uh, most of the patient at the three years. Uh, the, uh, uh, scarfold disappeared, and for the some uh, animal uh, ex, uh, study in vitro has most uh, about ninety three percent of the molecular weight disappear at three years. At three years, so the reason I ask that is because you know, when we wrote the paper about evaluation of absorbable scaffolds, um, we made a point to say we need to follow up past the time of complete absorption, because then we would expect uh, that, that all the events that are related to a stent go away. Um, Marty, you have a question? Just one final question. In the, in the tail end of the absorb era of BRS, we were extremely conscious of the procedural technique. So we did intravascular imaging for sizing. We did pre-dilatation fairly aggressive. And we did post-dilatation with non-compliant balloons. Is the technique the same in this new era with thinner strut BRS? I did notice you did more post-dilatation in the BRS versus the EES groups. Yes, I agree, totally agree with you. In this uh, new thinner st uh, struct BRS, we used uh, the criteria of the PSP uh, to prepare preparation carefully and select the, the size and the post dilatation proportion was not over 95%. Yeah. I think it's also to explain the comparable result of these two stand. Are there any questions from the audience? I, I'd like to remind you that you can also ask questions um, online on your, on your mobile, on the app. Uh, so I they will show up here and uh, I can read them out. 
Okay, if not, then we move on. Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, announce Martin Leon, who will talk about the uh, target clinical trials roadmap and uh, an update on the North American trial. Martin. Andreas, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I applaud all of you for uh, enduring a long day at PCR again. Uh, this is a fascinating topic. It's difficult to make interesting because there's so much clinical data to present. So I'm gonna try to summarize for you and give you a sense as to the clinical evidence that's being displayed for this particular device, the Firehawk stent that you're very much familiar with, my potential conflicts of interest. So it begins with a very busy slide, which shows you the clinical trials roadmap of all the studies that were originally supported by the sponsor, including the initial beginning of target FIM, first in man, target one, target two, the all-comer trial in Europe, and then many other studies that were related to either complex lesions or different pharmaco um, uh, therapy regimens or specific country trials, so a total of 14 clinical trials. And then an additional 12 clinical trials that were uh, investigator-initiated studies, again probing mechanistic insights, complex lesion subsets, all of which provides, I think, a very robust data set to look at. So I think we can say with a certain degree of confidence that the safety and efficacy of this Firehawk stent, which as you know is a thin strut cobalt alloy stent with abluminal grooves that have a bioresorbable polymer containing a low dose of serolima. So it has some of the most esoteric features of a drug-eluting stent. And we now have ongoing and proposed global clinical studies involving over 35,600 patients, probably as well studied a device in the coronary circulation as has been done by anyone, anywhere. So some of the results very quickly from the target one randomized trial with five year follow up compared to um, uh, um, uh, um, Everolimus eluding stents showing no difference for all comparisons of clinical endpoints. Looking at safety endpoints sh showing very low definite and probable stent thrombosis. Looking at a long lesion subset again showing results that are at least as good as the comparison stent. So this novel Firehawk design has clearly demonstrated safety and efficacy from these two clinical trials that were done in China. So this now gets expanded to an all-comers trial uh, chaired by William Wines that was in Europe involving uh, almost 1,700 patients. Again, a direct comparison of Firehawk versus the Zions. Um, Everolimus almost saluting stent, looking at the OCT sub-study here with three-month outcomes, demonstrating all of the relevant OCT endpoints, new interval thickness, covered stents, malopose struts, showing very similar outcomes between the new Firehawk versus the Everolimus eluding stent and the powered QCA sub-study at 13 months, again showing very low late loss that was comparable to and certainly had a relevant p-value for non-inferiority compared to the Everolimus eluding stent and 12-month clinical outcomes, again showing very good results that are at least the equivalent to what has been one of the predicate standards of drug eluding stents, both at 12 months and now at five years follow-up. So these are very robust and interesting data, we believe. This leads to an exploration of more complex lesions. This is an interesting study. We generally don't see randomized trials uh, in chronic total occlusions. This is chaired by Yaling Han, very well-known um, interventionalist in China. About 200 patients comparing Firehawk versus the Zion CES. Again, looking at a 12-month instant late lumen loss uh, as the uh, um, uh, relevant primary endpoint, showing a late loss of about 0.21 in both groups, so clearly non-inferior. But interestingly, when you look at the clinical outcomes, it appeared that the Firehawk had lower clinical outcomes, at least in this small randomized trial. Not really power to show much in the way of clinical differences, but for many of the clinical endpoints did appear to be a superior uh, to EES in this complex lesion subgroup. 
There are additional data in STEMI, this OCT trial, um, in a small number of patients showing in a STEMI population, again, that neoentomal thickness at six months and the other relevant endpoints, covered struts and malopause struts, were very similar compared to uh, the Zions EES. Now three pharmacotherapy trials, the first shared by Jim Bogu, large 2,500 patient trial looking at three versus 12 month DAPT in a near real world like patient population. A second one target safe um, that looks at one versus six month DAPT in patients that are high bleeding risk. And then a third, the target first trial that's chaired by Giuseppe Tarantini, uh, looking at one versus 12 month DAPT in a very open label randomized trial in AMI patients. So these are interesting pharmacotherapy studies, the results of which are still pending, but certainly would give us greater insights as to whether or not reduced DAPT therapy can be accompanied with the Firehawk in a variety of subsets. This takes us to the target for North American trial. So we have been anxious to have an opportunity to, to work with this device in the United States. This is a single blind non-inferiority trial in patients with at least two target vessels, a maximum of two target vessels, and up to two target lesions per vessel. Um, there were certain restrictions on lesion length, had to be less than 34 millimeters. Vessel diameters were between 2.25 and 4 millimeters. Uh, and there were very few exclusion criteria, uh, CTOs, vein grafts, and very recent STEMIs. We randomized 1,720 patients. There was both a QCA and an OCT subset, and about 100 sites from the US, Canada, Europe, and Japan. <laughs> And this is now fully enrolled, including the subset um, trials as well, and is in follow-up. So a significant number of patients from Canada, 473 patients, 751 from the US, and 496 from our colleagues in Europe. So uh, a total of over 1,700 patients. Last patient enrolled was November of 2022. Um, uh, and we're very excited to be able to see the endpoint of this important clinical trial that we hope we'll be able to present at TCT next year. Um, so we are very excited to see what has been a global clinical trial blueprint with this very interesting and important drug-eluting stent that really spans the breadth of geographies, lesion complexity, pharmacotherapy alternatives with a patient population of over 35,000 individuals. So, so certainly no, no paucity of data to look at, addressing now the full spectrum of disease complexity, which we think is important as you characterize a new drug-eluting stent. And would conclude that this novel Firehawk um, uh, serolimus eluding stent, which features the thin strut design, abluminal grooves containing the biodegradable polymer and serolimus, which gives you a very localized and targeted drug delivery, that there is very nicely demonstrated safety and efficacy in standard risk populations from target one and two. The safety and efficacy was comparable to Zion's uh, EES from real world and complex populations in a variety of studies, including target all comers, target CTO, target STEMI, variety of OCT trials. There will be an immense evidence database, including, as we said, a large number of patients from now 27 clinical trials that will address various safety and efficacy issues under various circumstances from the target global clinical trials in the future. And we are anxiously awaiting and excited about the final results of the target for North American trial, which we hope to present at TCT next year. Thank you. Darren, I think you had a question. Um, so, Marty, um, with 27 trials, including 35,000 patients across FIM, um, type A lesions, all comers, CTO, STEMI, OCT substudies, IVA substudies, all geographies, um, maybe a question uh, first re regarding Microport. Where do they take this from here? Are they done? Are there new technological developments in terms of stent design coming? 
And then maybe a second question in relation to the DES era. Um, are we finished and how do we continue to fund these large studies when, um, when the cost of stents and so forth is declining? Those are two good questions. I'm going to take the second one first. I think we've gotten into a rut with clinical research, doing the same kinds of studies again and again and again. I think that we can learn from the past and the degree to which we need these complex, multi-thousand patient randomized trials to qualify and characterize new devices, I think is not to me a modern era approach. And I do think that there's an opportunity now to develop what the buzzword we use now is pragmatic clinical trials, where we have an earlier opportunity to be able to access in real time, real world patients from very large, well characterized registries and compare some of the key endpoints with what is a very large database of other devices that have been available and approved. So my hope is in the future we can simplify, reduce the cost of these important clinical trials and not have to do the same level of multiple, multi-thousand patient randomized trials. And the randomized trials can be embedded in these registries as well if you choose to randomize. So I'm hoping the future will be different in terms of how we do clinical research. With respect to technology, um, I will say um, uh, 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 that in drug-eluting stents, we have largely achieved, I think, pretty much a flattening point, a leveling off of the technology advances. This is a thin strut design with a very low dose of sirolimus that has these abluminal grooves that, with a bioresorbable polymer, there, there, there isn't that much room, I think, for important uh, evolution of this device. Um, uh, th this would be, uh, by virtue of characteristics, would be different than anything we have in the United States and would be viewed as a novel device, even though it's been around for, you know, as you know, you know um, uh, the better part of a decade. Um, so for DES, I think we've seen a flattening of the technology evolution, but there are other new um, uh, drug-eluting stents that you just saw that are bioresorbable, and there are some hybrid designs that are being developed, and there are multi-drug combinations that are being developed by other um, um, sponsors and uh, interesting versions of drug-eluting stents, but I think the Firehawk, uh, you know, to me, sh you know, has the opportunity to be really a standard for years to come in this space. Uh, uh, yeah, I have another question down down that road, and and that is, I mean, thirty-five thousand patients. It's it's safe. It's efficient. We 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 know it all. What does it take? for a stent to be adopted in a marketplace, for let's say the US, for a stent to being used, to be you know, taken off the shelf and put into patients? You know, it's a great question. <clears throat> um, uh, there have been two other non-US drug-eluting stents that have gone through the gauntlet <clears throat> of randomized trials and FDA approval, neither of which has really um, been able to achieve traction in the U.S. market in an important way. There's another study that's been completed um, that is pending FDA approval, uh, a device from China, and Firehawk would be the next. Um, uh, I think it needs a very strong sponsor. I think that the uh, economics you know, need to be appropriate and reasonable. Um, uh, and um, I think in the United States, if you have a device that uh, there's still physician preference still plays a very large role. So I think if we can get the data out to a large enough community of physicians, they have opportunity to use the device. Um, I, I, you know, I still think that there's a, a, a real chance that this could become, you know, one of the key products that we would use um, in a routine way. Thank you. Are there any questions? We don't have any further, so I think we move on. Thank you very much, Marty, for this interesting <laughs> overview. It's in town. Okay, we're going to move on. So we've now been in the coronary vasculature. We're now going to go into the structural space, and we're going to begin with a very interesting a presentation of the microport left atrial appendage closure pivotal study called Safe Protect, which is a randomized control trial with one year results presented by Dr. Ben Hay. Yes, it's my great honor to be here to 
on behalf of our group to report the Safe Protect AF results. <coughs> this is 12 months' results, and <coughs> this is a disclosure of the interest. The background of this study is that the percutaneous disclosure of the left artery appendage is an alternative to chronic oral anticoagulation to reduce shock risk in patients with low valvular artery fibrillation. The Safe Protect AF trial is a NMPA regulatory requirements pre-market pivotal study, and during the trial enrollment, the Watchman LAA closure was the only device for transcaster LAA closure, both approved by FDA and NMPA in China. The Anchorman Microport Shanghai product is a novel LAA closure with short-run distal design and 3D folding technology. However, the safety and effectiveness was unclear for Anchorman whether we will prevent the risk of stroke or systemic embolization from the area in patients with long valvular artery fibrillation. So we report the, and do this study to now report the 12 months' results. The objective is to evaluate the safety and the effectiveness of the anchorman on these devices. This is the device design. This is an innovative round distal end for the more safety advance and retreat in the LAA. And in that 3 d insert, so less major exposure, reducing the devices related thrombosis and dense nitty frame conformed better to anatomy of the LAA, improving seeding performance. There are 12 anchors, this particular design to avoid device embolization and pericardial effusion. <coughs> the safety protect trial design, we, the, the, we have the three sites, three hospitals participate in the rowing cohort. The, and then we, this is the RCT. The, I'm the PI of this study and Professor Chu Huimin is the copy. I. The RCT, we, it, the expected number is 210 patients, and both sides is 105. And the patient was in enrollment. The primary endpoint for this study is the post index procedures, 12 months clinical success rate, defined as the freedom rate from ischemia or hemorrhagic stroke, systemic embolization or cardiovascular or unexplained death. Secondary endpoints, including the device success rate, post index procedure, 12 months area occlusion rate, TE residual jet less than 5 millimeters, and the clinical endpoints at 1 to 5 years, now is 1 year, the instant of stroke on the TIA, the death or systemic embolization, and the severe breathing events, and device related complications. The same size of calculation for primary endpoint that is expected for 12 months is clinical success rate for both devices is 90, 97%. It's a long infinity margin around the 7% and the expected rate of attrition is 10%. The secondary endpoint also is the same. So the, the number of the total number is 210 and 105 in both group. The inclusion criteria, including the patients age between 12, 18 to 80 with long valve artery fibrillation, the CHAVA scores is more than two points in women, three points, who meet any of the following criteria. Patient has a history of the hemorrhagic or bleeding tendons more than six months ago. The intolerance of, of long-term anticoagulation therapy, stroke or embolic events still occurred with standard anticoagulation therapy, has spread scores more than three, and patient was right and informed consent. The exclusion criteria including the follows, the rheumatic heart disease and requiring long-term oral anticoagulation, initial inset and, and the untreated artery fibrillation or secondary artery fibrillation with explained cause, the presence of persistence of thrombosis in the heart chambers, experience myocardial infarction within three months, and prior cardiac valve replacement, received a heart transplantation or a severe heart failure. And the study organizations, 
we have steering committee members or the independent DSMB and independent T call rep. The patients also 239 patients from 16 Chinese centers were assessed for eligible between March 2021 and to September 2022. And they enrolled in, in three uh, centers, including 23 patients. So the 216 patients were randomized in the RCT cohort, 1.1. 1, 1. <clears throat> and the 12 months, 12 months T follow-up was around 85%. This is a demographic or baseline characteristic of these two patients. It is very similar between the two groups, the balance in the two groups, for the type of artery fibrillation Chava uh, score, then the Hespre score, and the medical history, or the, whether patients have the, the TIA or the, the systemic implantation. Then also patients that the, the half value percentage and the renal disease or other diseases are very balanced between the two groups. But it's important that, to point out that the one stop combined artery vibration, abrasion or luck is, in, is around the accounts for 70% in both groups. In Ackerman, is 73, and the Watchman group is. 70, also balanced in these two groups. <clears throat> the pre procedure characteristic is the local anesthesis in both groups is over 80%. And the time from the shift insertion is also very similar between the two groups. The attempts to the implant the occlusal system success, the first attempt to success rate is 91 in the anchorman and the 88 in the watchman group. And the residual jet between three to five millimeters is 9.2 in the anchorman group and the 5.8 in the watchman group. This is just in the post procedure residual jet. This is the 12 months follow up. The, we, we can see that the residual jet between three to five millimeters in the anchorman group is 5.7, and watchman group is 15.9. This is get a, 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 a little bit difference. The P wave is less than uh, 0.05. The primary endpoint was achieved in the non infinity criteria. <coughs> also, the secondary endpoint, the power secondary endpoints, also achieved in the 12 months. This is the two months and 12 months TEP pre devices leak severity. We can see that the, the, the results I've just mentioned. This is the <coughs> Leak between the, the moderate leak it is 26, 27 percent in the, in the first in the first two months, but in the 12 months, the anchorman group this to the is achieved to the six percent, and the, the the watchman group is 16 <clears> percent. <throat> the 12 months clinical outcome is very similar between the two groups. It's very similar than in the primary endpoints. So the conclusion of this clinical trial is the primary endpoint and power secondary effective effectiveness endpoints were met. The safety at 12 months clinical success rate is 98% in for both groups. Effectiveness at 12 months area occlusion rate was 100% for both groups. Despite the prison study had higher percentage of one stop combined the artery fibrillation, abrasion, and the LAAC procedure in both groups, the pre-procedure complications, DRT and ischemia stroke were lower and comparable between the two groups. The Anchorman LAA closure devices was long inferior with respect to safety and effectiveness long in long hour valvular well artery fibrillation patients compared to the Watchman LAA device. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much. It was very clear and very uh, nice results. I have just uh, one comment about yeah. uh, you show a very interesting result and in, uh, on the procedural aspect and also the clinical uh, outcomes. And I was wondering what was uh, the regimen of antiplatelet or antithrombotic agent that you propose for your patient in both group? Yes, very good questions. At the first design that we discussed, that whether we have to ask for doctors for the standard care of the post procedures anticoagulation. Uh, but we, we want to make it more to the real world uh, scenario, scenario. So that we let the anticoagulation or anti predict uh, by the decision of the doc by doctor decisions. So the most of our patients, the anti post procedure anticoagulation is uh, following our consensus published in our countries 2009. December 2009 or so, at, at the time that we have the, our Chinese consensus that we suggest that most of the patients after pro, uh, LAA procedures should be anti, anti coagulation for three months uh, uh, with the no NOAC and, and plus experience or uh, chlorpidogrel, 50 milligram or 75 milligram. Then if the TE is okay, it's not DRT or, or, or leak, we can stop the anticoagulation and make the DAPT for another several months to half an hour. Then the one anti antiplatelet drugs uh, aspirin or chlorpidogrel for long term. This is our regimen for the anticoagulation. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, a qu question about the procedures. Um, so 70% of patients got a, a concomitant um, atrial fibrillation ablation, which is fantastic yeah. for them. Um, but 80% were done under local anesthesia. Um, in my institution, the, the um, AFib ablations are, are done uh, under general anesthesia. How, how, how is that done in your institution? Is it deep sedation? Do you use um, intracardiac echo or do you use um, transesophageal echo or what is your, how do you make this work? Yes, they're very good questions. In Chinese, pro, in, in Chinese protects, our EP guides do artery fibrillation with lo just local anesthesia, no general or no very deep excitations, no. They don't do anything. So the, the most of our patients is the, because of the artery fibrillation patients coming from EP guides, they recommend our patients. So the, the most of patients receive the, the local anesthesia only. And what do you do first, the ablation yes. or the closure? <laughs> it also very quick, quick questions. The most of, of our procedures is the, the PVI first, then LL occlusion. But several of, uh, as I remember, in our centers, we some, sometimes we do the occlusion first, but it is just the same, very, very few patients, it's not a routine. In the routine procedures, we do the PVI first. Just as a point of clarification, the control group was Watchman. I assume yeah. it was the original Watchman, not the Watchman Flex. Flex. Yes. which is currently used. Yes. Because the, your, your, your device looks a lot more like the Watchman Flex yes. than the original Watchman. Yes, very good, good comments. Because at the time, the, the Watchman Flex is, is just approved to, uh, last year, in okay. the end of last year, maybe. So the, at the time we designed it, it's just about 7, 2.5. You know, one question I had was, at least in the United States, Yep. The regulatory approval studies are large trials, well over a thousand patients, mainly yes. because of safety <laughs> concerns. Um, because for these devices to be used, the safety record has to be extremely good. So you were able to do a randomized trial of 210 patients. Do you have any other data using Anchorman that would give us more confidence about the safety issue? Yes. Also, very good question. I think that this is the, the regulatory of our our Chinese FDA. They only 
requires the, the, this number is enough. Okay. But the, so they are preclinical. We also ask them to increase more uh, data, and we, we also ask them to have the support and give us more support for follow study to to make our. Uh, confidence to say this is a very good device, I think. So okay. if there are no further questions, thank you very much. Thank you. And we come to the final talk of this session uh, presented by Ling Tao. Uh, it's about aortographic regurgitation assessment of TAVI patients uh, treated with the VitaFlow and all the others. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and it's my great honor to present this quantitative angiographic assessment of regurgitation in patients treated with VitaFlow. Um, I'm from Xijing Hospital in Xi'an, China, and I have nothing to disclose. Uh, so this moderate or severe aortic regurgitation post harbor is associated with increased long-term mortality. But this accurate procedure assessment of AR is critical, but it's difficult. So the traditional AR assessment tools we use by visual grading, or echo, or cardiac MI, or sometimes we use hemodynamic index. But um, this qualitative angiographic assessment of AR was emerged as an accurate and fast tool, and also saved the cost. So the limitation of these AR assessment tools, like, uh, like Sailor's classification, which is subjective and poorly reproducible. With echo, uh, we maybe require general CZR and also semi-quantitative. And also it's influenced by image, plan, and some posterior GS is difficult to be acquired. And also the intermodality inconsistence is, exists. So CMI may be reliable, but is not feasible for guiding uh, during tower procedure. So that's why we choose this um, quantitative angiographic assessment of AR, which is a video densitometric um, method, which is objective, accurate, reproducible. And VAC3 has listed, listed this technique as a reliable modality. So, um, this uh, quantitative assessment of AR performed use a single uh, autogram uh, with uh, two time density curves uh, obtained in the reference area, which is out root, and in the region of uh, re interest, which is LVOT. The ratio between the two areas under the time density curves is translated in percentage of regurgitation. Uh, which is provided by Pine Medical, the Cas A valve software. And this method is validated in vitro in animal model, also re regards to uh, echo and MIR. And this presented case, we can sh uh, see this case compared with MIR and with very comparable uh, with um, this uh, mild uh, and PVR and uh, moderate to severe PVR is also very comparable. So, and also it has been sure to have a prog prognostic value at the threshold of 17%. If the LVOTR more than 70%, it appeared with uh, a poor prog prognosis compared with less than 17%. And so we, this is our study design. It's a retrospective, multi-center, and et cetera, collab uh, uh, analyze. Uh, we include uh, uh, consecutive patients with Vita flow from uh, four Chinese centers uh, with total 172 cases. And we compare with uh, this uh, uh, LVOTR analysis of uh, uh, five, uh, five self-expandable uh, valves, and which uh, with uh, public in published poor database from the collab. And among these 170 and uh, outer uh, grams of patients treated with VitaFlow, we have only 107 final autograms were analy analyzable by LVOTAR because it's a retrospective. And there are some overlapping of descending order with LVOT or overlapping of descending order on 
uh, ascending and outer. And also there are some cases duration of the acquisition time is too short. Uh, the deep breathing or table motion uh, may affect the result and some with insufficient contrast, it, it's difficult to do measurement. And also there are some radio pack structure in LVOT. So we analyze 107 cases and because these four Chinese centers include us, we are still in learning uh, course, learning uh, like period. So there are eight cases uh, we do a valve in valve and due to an uh, inappropriate tower positioning. And interesting, there are, among these eight cases, there are two we cannot analyze. And, but uh, with uh, six that can, can be analyzed, there are two cases less than 17%, but we also do valve in valve. Um, and uh, uh, the average of uh, uh, the percentage post, um, the, at, after the first valve, about 22%, but post, uh, after the uh, second valve, average 2.5%. And we compare, uh, compared the mean LVOT AR after tower among these six uh, valves. And we found that uh, with the mean LVOT after a intermediate autogram, uh, uh, it's 7.3%. Uh, but the final autogram after valve in valve is 6.1%, followed by Everett Bro 7.3, Everett R 7.9, Venus A, this is another Chinese valve, 8.9. The accurate NEO 9.6 and core valve 70% 7. There's um, no difference between other valves, but we, we do have a, a find the difference compared with core valve, which is higher. This uh, cumulative percentage of these uh, different degrees of the post harbor AR, and we can see that the moderate to severe um, it's uh, about 4.7% uh, uh, for uh, Vita flow, and uh, uh, followed by Everett Pro 5.3, and some uh, valves with even uh, more than 10% of moderate to severe based on QAR method. So which is obviously <laughs> uh, it's, uh, different from a uh, side report. This is cumulative frequency curves of LVOTR. Um, so we, so this red dot, that's uh, after the first valve and uh, the, the purple uh, after second valve. And so um, it's, uh, uh, there, this uh, gray uh, threshold is all uh, the cases uh, that with moderate to severe uh, um, aortic regurgitation. So there are some limitations uh, for this uh, study because it's a, um, uh, a retrospect study and uh, analyzable of AR by this quantitative assessment pretty low. And only acute performance of AR following tower was reported. And this calcification or other bicuspid valve uh, and other um, uh, features may affect this AR was not connected in this study and acro uh, cardiographic data were not connected. But we draw the conclusion that compared to other commercially available self-expanding valves, VitaFlow seems to have a low degree of AR and a low proportion of patients with moderate to severe AR as assessed by this qualitative video desktopic angiography. So once the learning phase is completed, I think the comparison of AR between different valves and also this method compared with stand of care method should be attempted in, in a prospective randomized trials. And so uh, there's a previous study called over uh, study that compared online feasibility of analysis by site compared with analysis uh, edu uh, educated by the CoLab, co -lab, which is very comparable. That makes this method can be uh, the guidance of the procedure uh, during the procedure. So this is a case that before post dilation, and we use three minutes maybe to, to do the analyze, we can see that the uh, VDAR is 26%. So after post dilation, the VDAR is dropped to 6%. So we let the patient off the table. So 
based on this result, uh, we designed Overguide China, uh, we, um, is, which is um, uh, RCT, and we use a VDAR guidance arm compared with standard of, of care arm, and uh, which uh, VDAR we may use uh, local anesthesia, and standard of care it depends on the the doctors. Most of them use general anesthesia, and those after uh, assessment, we let the doctors know the result and they can use post dilation or other method to, uh, 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 to do the, the, the post uh, uh, treatment. And then the, uh, after the discharge, we will do a cardiac MR uh, regurgitation fraction as a primary endpoint. So we, we will include uh, over 300 uh, patients in this study. Hopefully, I can report this result very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That, that, that looks like a, a new tool for us to assess the quality of our, our implantations. Can I ask a couple of, of questions to sure. your work? Um, where did you, this looks like, like what's been done in Galway in parallel. Uh, and I, I wonder where the uh, information about the other valves comes from. Is that uh, from, a, from your own lab or oh, is no. that? Uh, yeah, actually this uh, information from the call lab. Uh, uh, we uh, collaborate with uh, Dr. Patrick Sorais uh -huh. and, uh, and also Osama, and they provide pull this database from the call lab. Yeah. It's a growing database, I think. Um, I think you made it very clear that, that in the retrospective analysis, despite the fact that a lot of uh, patients had to be excluded, these were all down to things um, that if one know the analysis is being done, you can avoid. How, how many patients do you think uh, would you be able to enroll in a prospective trial? Is it close to 100%? Uh, yeah, I hopefully, uh, of course we need some guideline to uh, uh, acquisite the, the qualified uh, the angiogram. It's, uh, I think it's important. But we like QCA. We never get 100% image to to do a QCA analysis. But I hope we we will have a guideline. Like uh, we need to the the pigtail, uh, the le uh, to uh, at least I think uh, no more than two centimeter away from the cuspid, and also we have to limitation limit. Uh, the flow uh, speed and also the pressure, and we need to at least 12 to 20 uh, millimeter, millimeter uh, contrast, which is which is important for this analyze. We need to do this, and also I think uh, the radio uh, uh, radio pack structures that is also uh, need to be aware uh, aware. So if with these guidelines, so every doctors use a qualified image, I think we should get very good result for 100% maybe. <laughs> there, there will always be one that gets it wrong, but 99% uh, <laughs> will be great. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any further questions to this new technique? There is one. I have one concern about the blood pressure actually uh, and the uh, size of the ascending aorta. So if it differs blood pressure, then um, it's not so easy to quantify all just giving the same amount, just giving the same pressure, but it is also related to uh, the blood pressure of the patient at the moment and the size of the aorta. Is there a problem with that? Yes, of course. Yeah, it's a very good question. And also, it's not only the pressure, uh, heart, uh, blood pressure. Actually, uh, for some uh, fast passing, I think it affects the result. So we should wait at least five minutes after fast pacing. And we, we should wait for hemodynamic stable to do the measurement. And that's very important. Yeah, one f <coughs> final question. Um, certainly to be able to discriminate moderate or severe PVL is quite important. I think everyone would agree. But more recently, uh, people are becoming very interested in trying to reduce or eliminate mild PVL. And I'm trying to understand if this technique is sensitive enough <clears throat> to distinguish mild PVL from non-trace PVL. Um, because that will be an important consideration for the future. 
Yes, I think it's very important. Uh, based on this uh, previous um, the study, um, they gave the threshold 6% and 17%. So the between 6 to 17, it's border zone. Uh, as they think it's a mild um, regurgitation. But I think with more cases, we may know that this border zone we need still uh, specify. Um, so yeah, like uh, the, uh, as I show that there are two cases, only 30% and 15%. By hemodynamic, the doctors still do valve in valve. So that means 70% is also, it's not also need to be further studied. Thank you very much. Excellent. So we are perfectly on time, Andreas. That's incredible. Um, so, <clears throat> so, so to conclude, before you leave, um, uh, th th this has been a very instructive and valuable session. I want to thank the sponsor, Mike Report, for their cooperation and uh, support for this um, symposium. Um, it's a remarkable a company with a lot of versatility in terms of cardiovascular products. We began by looking at the new three-year results from Future 2, which is a thin strut bioresorbable scaffold, the Firesorb BRS, that showed some very encouraging data and is a look to the future of where this might be valuable going forward. Then we moved further to talk about the, the compendium of data from the target uh, trials um, showing that this is a very safe and effective, the Firehawk DES device with a lot of enthusiasm that is now growing to see it generalized in terms of use, not just to the European continent and Asia, but also hopefully to North America. Then we proceeded to look at the Anchorman left atrial appendage occlusion device, showing in a very nice randomized trial that this was equivalent to the Watchman device, which is the predicate device now <clears throat> in the United States and elsewhere, uh, and the device showing very good safety profiles and some very interesting features. And finally, and most recently, um, uh, a novel and interesting quantitative angiographic technique to be able to quantitate um, aortic regurgitation, which I think um, with further uh, um, uh, maturation and evolution uh, could become a technique that would be very valuable in many environments that would reduce cost and improve the sensitivity of detecting PVL after TAVI. So again, four very interesting presentations that raise some important questions that are all being addressed by very novel products. And I want to congratulate the speakers and the discussants for their good questions and the attendees for their uh, attention. Thank you very much.